Hello everybody, on today's flight we're going to be taking a look at how to fly the CJ-4. Now the CJ-4 is kind of neat because unfortunately there's not a lot of documentation available on the internet, so a lot of this is going to basically be conjecture as well as a little research I was able to determine with it. That being said, this is an absolutely solid aircraft, has a couple little bugs which we'll be kind of bringing out as we do it, and there's several mods available on the flight simulator forums that will help address that. Presently right now we're here in our beautiful Manchester, New Hampshire, we've got these nice nasty overcast skies, probably a little bit of turbulence all the way down but uh, it's not going to bother us too much in this jet let's go ahead and get started so first things first uh, the one nice thing about these business jets is they were optimized to be able to be started quickly all the systems on board are basically as simplified as they can possibly be and unlike some of the other aircraft in this one the avionics on here are a little bit older than what you probably are used to from other aircraft so let's go ahead and get this thing started First things first, uh, we're going to want to come down here to our electrical panel. This is nice and straightforward. We're going to go ahead and set our battery to the on position. As soon as we do that, we're going to get this middle display. Now, the neat thing here is there's actually an extra switch here for avionics, and we can set this to what they call dispatch mode. When you do that, you're going to get a big angry thing saying battery amp, battery amp, just letting you know that we're discharging quite a bit of energy here. Now, getting this thing started is just easy. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to swing on down, go ahead and flip on my beacon light to let everybody know I'm going to get started. It's kind of nasty the outside so I'm going to flip on my navigation light too. Now to start this thing you have these two engine run stop switches. You want to go ahead and pop both of those open and then you're going to come down here where it says engine starter. Normally with this aircraft uh, you're supposed to be starting the right engine and then the left engine but believe it or not in this version of flight sim you can actually do something extremely naughty like that you can start both of them simultaneously. Now, once you've gone ahead and pressed either of those buttons, again, if we were trying to do these things nice and nice and slowly, we just go ahead and press the right one, wait for it to spool up, press the left one, wait for it to spool up. But you can see, we can start both of these engines simultaneously. So now they're gonna go ahead and get themselves going, and uh, they're doing a pretty nice job of that, as you can see right away. Now, the avionics in this aircraft, like I was saying, are a little bit older, and they're basically based around an FMS system, which you probably recognize as being from the Boeing 747. Now, what makes this system very, very different from what you've seen in the other one is this is more like the Airbus than it is like the Boeing. Personally, I think it's a little oversimplified, but it does a decent job. You know, if we wanted to, we could go to position initiation, we could go ahead and define our default position. We're currently here in Manchester, New Hampshire, so it can come up here, set this as my reference air port. I go over here and normally you click on the root button, but you can see the root button does not work. If I press the flight plan button on the flip side, that does bring us to the ability to go in here. So now if we wanted to, we could go ahead and go to the next page real quickly. We could dial in individual positions that we wanted to. For example, if we wanted to go via ORW, we could just come in here like this, and then normally this will let us select which one we want. We want to use this particular one. We could activate it, execute it, and now if you'd actually take a look, we've modified our flight plan. If you wanted to take a look at the legs of the flight plan, you can see we only have a single leg right now because whenever you do a direct flight plan, your first position and last position are going to be skipped under the legs option. Now, if I wanted to, of course, we could go ahead and select departure arrival. We could go ahead and set our departure runway. So in this particular case, I'm looking outside the runway real quickly. I believe the wind is coming from this this direction over here. So we're not going to be taking runway 17. We're basically going to be taking the runway we're already kind of facing. Before I do that though, since our engines are started, I'm going to flip my avionics to the on position, double check to make sure both generators are running. Otherwise you could have all sorts of wonderful problems later on. So you can see we have a couple different choices here. We're going to be taking off runway 24 today. Looks pretty good. We can select our SIDs from here, anything along those lines. Keep in mind after you make a change, normally you press the X button. So I'm going to go back to departure arrival. I'm going to do arrival. We happen to know the wind down there in Providence. We're Rhode Island today. We're going to be doing ILS 23, and that's all we needed to do. Yes, I know it's 2 tree, but again, we're having a little bit of fun today and keeping things nice and simple. Now I can pop back to legs, and you can see everything's been neatly updated for us as far as that information goes. I can't recommend this enough. Set your flight plan up in the flight planner in Flight Simulator. Don't try to sit here and dial in each one of these waypoints. It's going to make you literally insane because you're going to change one, and then it's going to delete it, and then it's going to copy it, and you're just going to be going, okay, that sucked. The other thing I find very interesting is it already assumed that our cruise altitude is going to be flight level 700, which is, it's interesting. Again, this is a pretty short flight, so I don't think we're going to get up that high. Okay, with that set, let's go ahead and set up our MCP. Bunch of different modes. Anybody who's seen my autopilot tutorials are very comfortable with the operation of this system up top. Basically, we want to make sure our flight director is on the own position. We're going to go ahead and arm the navigation mode. In this case, usually what we want to do is we want to go ahead and take off whatever runway heading we're traveling on. So in this case, our runway is going to be runway 24. 
So I'm going to go ahead and dial in 24 very cautiously here. It looks pretty good. So now we know exactly what direction the runway that we're going to be taking off from is going to be set to. Of course, we could take a runway 17, which is located directly ahead of me if I wanted. So now that that's set, we're going to go ahead and pre-arm our altitude. Again, your altitude should be set based on how far you're going and all this other details. We're going to be setting this to 11,000 feet today. If we wanted to, we could set vertical speed mode. But for me, I'm going to be using the flight level change mode. I'm just going to arm it right now, set my flight level change speed, which is going to be 200. 140 knots. Now that's going to sound a little different for a jet. Most jets it's 250 and then it's 290. This aircraft is 240 knots all the way up until you hit a point where you can do Mach 0.74 and then you'd climb at Mach 0.74 the rest of the way. So that's kind of an interesting little difference. Okay, with all that information set, our parking brake is set, the aircraft is all engine, everything's running perfectly, everything's nice and smooth, our FMS has been preset, time to get this thing rolling. I'm gonna go ahead and make sure my barometric pressure is set correctly, and that's basically all there is to it. I'm gonna go ahead and release my parking brake real quickly, give it just a teeny tiny bit of thrust. All right, I noticed as soon as I killed that parking brake, this little display came up. This is your systems panel. If you don't want to be looking at your systems panel during an average flight, you can go ahead and quickly disable that by pressing the Sys button down here. So I'm going to go ahead and click that, so that way I have a better look at my engine settings. All right, for takeoff, we're going to be using one notch of flaps. So I'm going to go ahead and slap that to 15 degrees right there. And now we're just going to go ahead and get ourselves rolling along here. <laughs> there we go. So basically what we're going to do here is we're going to be going straight, we're going to be taking a left turn, we're going to cross, we're going to run this poor guy over. As everybody knows me, uh, my ability to drive an aircraft on the ground is not so great. Afterwards, we're going to take a left and we're going to swing right around and put ourselves right down on that side of things. Of course, looking at the windsock there, you can see a fact that things don't look too, too aggressive as far as weather goes today. All right, looking pretty good. We do want to use a full runway. This thing, while it has some thrust, doesn't have limitless thrust. Another thing I want to point out too is um, you're probably familiar with the fact this aircraft burns a bit more fuel than it's supposed to. Uh, that's unfortunate. And there's actually a really, really good mod on the Microsoft Flight Simulator forums that solves that problem. Meet, 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 meet. I have disabled traffic, but apparently I didn't disable traffic enough. Bring ourselves right over here. Now, this is an interesting fact. Look at how far up the ILS warning is. That's interesting. All right, going to go ahead and take ourselves a nice little left turn here. Again, I'm just regarding things like air traffic control, but that's not the point of this video anyway. Looking pretty good. Give it just a teeny tiny bit of thrust to get us rolling. And we're just going to kind of bounce along right here. And once this thing gets wrong, going, it gets going. One thing I love is the fact that the lights are buttons as opposed to switches. There's something so like modern and sci-fi about something like that. All right, looking pretty good. We're going to be heading around, as you can see. I'm going to pop up third person just to show you real quick. We're going to be scooting right around here. We're going to come down, take a left. You can see that we can just pop on right here as well. But in this case, I want as much runway as I can possibly get for this particular aircraft. Anybody who's tried to fly this thing at high altitude airports has already probably struggled with trying to get this thing airborne more than once. Yeah, this is what I get for flying with real-world weather today. It's kind of nasty, but that's all right. Hold the brakes a little bit. All right, normally we want to double check everything before we cross that runway threshold. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure my landing light's on. Look at awesome, it says click. <laughs> I love that. Give ourselves a little bit more thrust. We'll go ahead and get rolling. Now, one of the things I always like to do is I tap my timer button. There's actually a button they have for it, but unfortunately pressing it doesn't seem to do anything else but get some stress out. Line myself up. I'm going to go ahead and do our pre-flight takeoff. It looks like my flaps are in the correct position. My landing gear obviously in the correct position or we'd be making a lot of noises. And we're going to go ahead and get ourselves lined up at the center of the runway. Now you're going to be dealing with the first challenge with this aircraft, other than its prodigious fuel consumption. And that is going to be getting your takeoff thrust set correctly. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. All right, looks pretty good. Go ahead and hit the brakes and parking brake. Okay. So on this aircraft, normally this is basically a FADEX system. What you would do is you take the throttle, you push it up to which one of these detents you actually want it to operate. You have takeoff power, you have climb power, you have cruise power. And that's all you would have to do with this aircraft. Unfortunately, watch what happens if we set this to takeoff. Go ahead and release the parking brake. I'm going to push it all the way forward into the takeoff detent. Watch what happens. You're saying, oh, looks like everything was good. 
no no problems it looks like you're accelerating like a rocket ship and i'd say oh yeah we're accelerating like more than a rocket ship we're accelerating like 15 rocket ships as a matter of fact i don't think an f-15 has a thrust to weight ratio like that so then you're like oh everything seems to be going good everything's fine yep this takeoff thrust is nice why don't you go set it to climb thrust okie doke climb thrust all right everything looks good so far you're sitting there going hmm, nope everything looks good climbing quite nicely and this is when things start to get interesting do you happen to notice what temperature my two engines are presently operating at well maybe if i zoom in a little bit you can see it a little bit better Yes, we are way past the red line. As a matter of fact, we are almost a thousand degrees Celsius with these two engines, which would be more than enough to basically destroy them. Also notice that during this entire climbing sequence that I've managed to get myself almost up to 300 knots in that quick of a time. You can see this thing is literally ripping along at full blast and we're way into the hot zone. This aircraft should not have this much thrust. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Yes, that's correct. Normally what we would have to do if we're trying to be a little bit more conservative is we'd have to fly these engines so that this white line never crosses this red line. To do that though, if you take a look down at the handle, you can see we're way underneath even the cruise power setting. So now that we've got everything looking pretty good, I'm gonna go ahead and flip on the automatic pilot, which I just did. Now we're pretty much ready to go ahead and do our climb. Now I'm gonna behave a little bit here and I'm gonna to try to keep this needle back where it's supposed to be. I'm not gonna be doing any of this excessive thrust climbing. And you can see as usual, our automatic pilot is uh, struggling to get things under control. I'm gonna go ahead and give it the world's teeny tiniest little nudge to try to reel it back in. Now our climb speed in this aircraft is typically gonna be right around a speed of, uh, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. It's gonna be right around 240 knots. I mentioned that earlier. Now the reason we don't go up to 250 is if you actually take a look at the wing on this thing, you'll realize that this is not a very swept wing aircraft. As a matter of fact, this is basically optimized to give us an extra little bit of lift to kind of help us out during our climbs. As a result, we don't need to climb as quickly as we do with aircraft with a more swept wing. And there goes our automatic pilot kind of running around a little bit. I think it's going to catch it though. Nice. We got it. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and flip off our landing lights. And as we're climbing, we're going to take a look at some of the other fun features of this aircraft. Now, first things first, we don't have automatic throttle on here. We have to actually run this by hand. And as you've noticed, running it by hand is a bit of a process. Uh, otherwise, we have other issues with it. And again, there are mods in the forum that fix most of these issues. But one of the things I really like about this aircraft is these two pages are completely customizable. Let me show you what I mean by that. By coming up here, this is button that says PFD menu. If I click on that, it brings up this handy dandy little menu that lets me adjust different features. Now to control this, this is a little tricky. You have to actually come up here and use the bigger circle here to go ahead and roll your mouse left and right to go to a different page. Now if I wanted to, I could come down here and I could adjust the range so I could zoom in and out. I could also come over here and I could go down to bearing source if I really want to be crazy. Now if I click this little button that says push select, it brings up a brand new page. So I can actually come down here and now let's say I want to do bearing pointer two, I want to set it to VOR. I can now click that and now we would get a bearing on the outside, assuming this VOR frequency is valid that we could actually use for that purpose. So now, of course, I could go escape to return back to the main menu. I could come down here where it says config. I could press the middle button. You could change your pressure altitude. You could turn meters on. You can even come down here with references and we could go ahead and dial things like what our different speeds are. This also gives you the ability to set your minimum altitudes. In this case, it's going to be 200 feet for us. That's again, radar altitude, 200 feet. And notice we're leveled off. As you can see, this aircraft is rapidly accelerating because there's no automatic throttle. So what you're going to have to do as a pilot is catch it before you snap the wings off the plane. Now you think you can just slap it into the cruise position, but even the real aircraft, you can't actually do that. Doing that, again, you'd overspeed gradually. You're gonna to have to end up setting it by hand, which is what we just did. Okay, now that it's been set and we're all good to go, we'll go ahead and see we have all these cool little options. We have a VT. I'm gonna go ahead and use this one. I'm gonna set it up to 130 knots. Go ahead and set that real quickly. Then we can press the escape button. And again, we can come here if we want to switch to a VOR approach, like when we're going to do our ILS approach in a few minutes. We can come in here and actually change which mode it is. We can even go up to here and switch which uh, shape it is, rows. And of course, most of those buttons are featured up here as well. You can see I can snap between those two. You can also go between weather and terrain overlays. Now for me, if you just press this button once, you get a terrain overlay. If you press the button again, you get this glorious three-dimensional, or not three-dimensional, I should say, 300 
360 degree weather overlay, which is absurd. I can't believe this aircraft has a weather radar which can do a circle that complete. That's awesome. You can press it again and go back to this regular mode. I call this ocean mode because our water mode because you can kind of see everything underneath it. We also have other options as well, but unfortunately we can't control a lot of these things. You can adjust your barometric pressure right here for changing altitudes and everything like that. Zoom in, zoom out, everything is ready to go here. Now, just like this screen was controllable, this one is also controllable. So if you come down to this screen, you have the ability to dial in these features as well. There's an upper menu and there's a lower menu at escape. The upper menu gives you all this stuff. So for example, if I scroll to FMS text, prepare to be disappointed, boop, it gives us a nice little report here. It tells us where we're supposed to be. It tells us how long our flight's going to be. It gives us some details about all this. But this information never changes during your entire flight. So don't get too excited. We can also come down to systems, of course. Pressing the systems is the same thing as pressing the systems button here. So if I turn it on, you can see your battery. We can see your oxygen pressure hydraulics. If I press it again, of course, it goes to this maximized page right here. Now, of course, we have more things in here as well. We'll go back to the upper menu. We'll go to lower menu now. You can see we can change our format but notice the buttons for that are also available down here for example I could set it to arc mode some people like that some people like to set it to plan mode now plan mode you're sitting there going what does this show us this shows us what our next waypoint is and you can see it very clearly that it's taken us all the way down there we're actually going to probably cut that waypoint a little earlier so that we can go ahead and line ourselves up with a nicer landing here so we can go all the way down back up here go snap 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 go back to arc mode for those of you who are so inclined and now we see a more conventional arc. Crawling down here, we have the ability to go to map symbols as well. There's some crazy symbols you can go in here. You can do intersections, you can do airways, you could do uh, navigational aids, you can do airports, anything you could possibly want. The constraints, by the way, is if we had a specific altitude or speed constraint. Like I noticed when we cross this, we're supposed to be at 310, and you can see we need to be at 2300 when we get over here to uh, Suska. So now that that's all set, I'm going to go ahead and leave that alone. I kind of like it the way it is. Press escape. Press escape one more time. And of course, we can also change things like our zoom rate if we needed to. Again, this would be for the chart zoom. We have no chart feature in this aircraft. So again, if you wanted to change that zoom, you're going to have to come up here and play around with this in order to change the zoom for all your screens simultaneously. Keep in mind on this one, we also have the ability to change the terrain. So you could leave one at ocean slash water mode. You could leave another one set to terrain mode if you wanted. I'm going to press that again. And again, you get this glorious kind of reminds me of like a tie-dye shirt or something like that which gives us all the details we need with that so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna start bringing ourselves into a nice little landing so notice this is right off of the Airbus this is not off the Boeing this is really its own piece here so of course we could come in here and we could say we want to proceed direct to PVD but this is a good time to take a look at some of the other features of our actual aircraft Let's go ahead and shut that off since we're going to be at our destination in a minute. We're going to go ahead and dial our new destination altitude, which is going to be about 3,000 feet. Looks pretty good. I'm going to use vertical speed mode. We'll use... Uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. About 1,000 feet per minute should be good. Let's go ahead and reduce my throttle as well. We don't want to be ripping along too much. Remember, you need to be less than 250 knots when you cross 10,000 feet. So if you need to, you can always go ahead and flap out your speed brakes, which are the world's most effective speed brakes. Holy smokes, did you see that? But you can see we're going to be a nice and comfortable speed long before we get down to where we are. So we're coming down 1,000 feet per minute. Uh, controlling our speed here is going to be a function of our thrust. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of a little bit of information I have here to go ahead and line myself up with my ILS approach. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to heading hold mode. I'm going to synchronize it. Go ahead and slam this all the way to my left, right about there. You can see it gives you that beautiful little dash blue line. Press heading hold button. And now we're going to go ahead and start lining ourselves up for our landing at Providence. I'm going to go ahead and call up my little piece here, ILS 23 KPVD. All right, just taking a look. I've always got to check my notes, got to check my notes. All right, let's go ahead and show this to everybody so you all can see it as well. I'm going to make sure that's set up correctly. I want to make sure you have a good chance to see what I'm looking at so you can kind of understand what I'm doing. So basically what we're doing is if you want to imagine where my mouse is, we're going to be coming straight down here. We're going to proceed direct to this point here, cross Suska. We're going to need to be at an altitude of 2,200 feet, and our important frequency is going to be 109.3. We're going to have to keep all those things in mind. So let's go ahead and jump back here, give myself a little bit more thrust. All right, looks like we're approaching pretty nicely. I'm actually going to shut off FMS mode. I know that sounds very scandalous, but it's what we're going to need to do in order to safely land this aircraft using an ILS approach. So I'm going to change my nav source here. 
to VOR1. So now we can go ahead and lock that frequency in so we can be ready to do it. I'm going to press the escape key here. Now we're going to want to set our course. Remember, we're landing on runway 2 tree, so our course is going to be a 2 tree 0. Okay, looks pretty good. I'm just going to check something real quick. I want to make sure everything is exactly what I expect it to be. Okay, that will not let us control that, but ah, that's why. Sorry about that. So one thing I already forgot is you need to actually tell it that our nav source on this is also going to be the correct one. Otherwise, we're not going to have a lot of control over it. There we go. Now we should be able to dial it in. Oh, it's not letting us do that. That's news. It did not do that last time, but that's okay. We're still going to manage to land this aircraft safely. I'm not too worried about it. All right, we're going to go ahead and go over to our tuning page. This is going to allow us to define what radio frequency we're on. Remember, we're going to be landing on a frequency of 109.3. Ah, that's why we don't have control. So because it's an ILS and because we're on the top side of it, it's already pre-selected our course for us. As a matter of fact, if you look at the screen, see that blue line right there? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to confuse you. It's already pre-selected this because of the fact that it is an ILS approach, and it's already actually displaying it on the screen for us, which is awesome because now we know exactly where we need to be in order to land the aircraft. Go ahead and zoom in a little bit more. We need to actually come down to 2,200 feet, as you recall. So I'm going to go ahead and knock this all the way down to 2,200. And again, I'm just taking advantage of the heading hold mode here in order to get ourselves a little bit closer to the ground. But you can fly it in any which method that you prefer to do so. I actually want to decrease our vertical speed a little bit. We'll come down to 2,000 feet per minute. Since we're landing, I'm going to go ahead and flip on the landing light as well. Now, this is where the weather is going to get a little nasty today. Nothing too, too bad, but definitely noticeably interesting. We're exceeding the top speed again. Again, you, know, you should be talking while you're flying the plane. <laughs> that looks pretty good. Taking a look, taking a look. Everything looks awesome. Actually, we're in pretty good shape here. Go ahead and zoom in a little bit. Yep, so you can see we're getting that navigation information here. We're also getting the navigation information right here. We're going to be arriving at 2,200 feet pretty much right on time. You can see our constraints. See the 2,200 feet? It actually already knew that that was supposed to be the correct altitude that we're supposed to be landing at today, which I think is absolutely wild. It's glitching a little bit, but again, as long as it works, it doesn't bother me too, too much. At this point, of course, we could switch on to terrain mode if we wanted to keep an eye out for any angry mountains that we could possibly bump into. And now we have a nice, complete display with both terrain as well as, you know, like I said, water mode. Stick my head out the window. Uh, again, this is real world weather today. You can see that things are a little cloudy, which doesn't surprise me. It's the fall, so these kind of things happen all the time. Studying my approach plate one more time. Again, this aircraft is pretty easy to fly, except for the fuel consumption, which everybody's already mentioned before. You can see we've, um, even in this flight, look at this. We've already sucked down 10% of our total fuel reserves, which is incredible. And like I was saying, you got to be really careful with those engines. It's not quite the way that they behave. All right, looking pretty good, looking pretty darn good indeed. All right, just studying my speed. Everything looks good. We can see that I've selected my localizer if I wanted to, of course. I could go back to lower menu. I could set this back over to my FMS if I wanted. And the only advantage to that is the fact that it cleans out this big blue bar, which is already visible here. Again, I'm sorry I confused you folks about the course thing. That was just, I forgot that it automatically sets it. In the old days, they did not. So now that we're getting a little bit closer, you'll notice that we have a marking for our localizer here. We also have a marking for our glide slope at the top. I'm going to look out the window. Whoa, boy, we're going to be flying right through that. We're actually going to have to activate some anti-ice protection because that looks like it's going to get really nasty really, really quickly. So the anti-ice in this aircraft is not the world's most sophisticated. You just come down here and you do that. And then you get a big angry warning. <laughs> of course, we lost the top half of our page and it automatically displays it. But that's perfectly fine, too. All right, looking pretty good so far. Keeping an eye on my thrust. I'm actually at idle this entire time. This is a very aerodynamic aircraft. It does not take a lot. Of course, now we're hitting the thicker air, of course. Now things are going to start slowing down a little bit. All right, we're almost to our destination to start doing our approach. I'm going to go ahead and uh, reduce my range just a teeny tiny bit so we can see it very clearly. Now, the coolest thing is this yellow line will actually coincide with this one. It'll be collinear for just a moment there. All right, right in 2,200 feet. Hey, I told you we'd hit 2,200 feet on time. It's almost like I practiced, which unfortunately I did not, hence that oopsie. 
Okay. Now, one thing that I tried to do earlier is try to track down a really, really good information manual online about this particular aircraft. And unfortunately, it cost about a thousand bucks to get my hands on one. So I'm working a little bit from guesswork here, but I said that at the beginning also. Now, one thing that is a little bit of guesswork and I'm not really a fan of is the fact that our approach speed can be a very variable depending on how heavy this aircraft is. You know, everybody knows that. But for this aircraft, we actually have this tool up here called an AOA indexer. And that will actually allow us to determine our approach speed without actually needing to know what our approach speed is. I know that sounds like something you can't do, but it actually works really, really well. Speed up time just a teeny tiny bit here, get us a little closer to the ground. Perfect. Awesome. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use my heading mode to go ahead and line ourselves up really, really neatly with the end of the runway. And we want a heading of basically south, so we're going to do 180 or so. There we go. And we're going to go ahead and arm the approach as soon as we see the little pink line start to center. Of course, we want to start slowing down very, very aggressively. Okay, looking pretty good. There it goes. Approach hold on. Look at this. You can actually see the blue line center itself automatically. And we are in great shape. Now we're going to hold about 150 knots or so, which is going to be a pretty good speed. And again, you can see how everything overlays itself pretty effectively here. I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, disable those constraints because uh, they're making me slightly insane. Ah, much better. <laughs> go ahead and close that out. And unfortunately, we don't have the chart page, which is kind of a bummer. Remember that our frequency was already preset with this when we uh, chose our approach and flight planner, so I did not have to manually dial it in. If we had to, we could have come in here and done something like this. I'm going to put this in navigation too, and we can automatically select our VR frequency that way if it came up in that particular situation. You also have access to your air traffic control, aka your transponder. All right, time to start slowing down a little bit. And we're just out of the clouds. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we're doing as far as this goes. Looks pretty good. Oh yeah, this is going to be a it's going to be a bumpy approach. Nothing new though. You can see the aircraft has done a wonderful job of getting us nice and centered on the localizer, as always. Go ahead and zoom in a little teeny tiny bit here. All right, that's about as far as I'm going to get in. Now, usually what you do with flaps is you go ahead and give yourself a flap, notch of flaps out when you get a little bit further out. Once we have one dot above glide slope, that's usually when you put your last notch of flaps down as well as your landing gear. Slow down a little bit. There's my one notch. Flaps down, gear down. Give yourself a little bit of thrust. Nice. A little bit more thrust than that. Those are the world's highest drag flaps. <laughs> Nobody said it was a perfect model. Okay, so now how do we use this thing to determine what our approach speed is? Well, see this little circle in the middle? If you have a single green circle, it means you're at the correct angle of attack. If you have this one right here, that simply means that you're overdoing it. If you have this one, it means you're going too fast. So in this case, I'm doing about 120 knots right now, and I'm noticing that this is a perfect green circle. That means that we're actually having the nose at exactly the correct position for our landing. By no coincidence, our speed is about 120 knots. Now the nice thing is this information is provided for us over here. So we could literally go up and down with our speed until we notice that this index here for angle of attack is perfectly centered. So right now, as it stands, our angle of attack is absolutely perfect. One thing I'm not thrilled with though is I'm noticing that we're descending very very aggressively. I'm actually going to go ahead and lock out the altitude real quickly. And I'm going to go ahead and reacquire the glide slope. Again you always want to be keeping a good situational awareness no matter what it is. There we go. So now we're going to go to hold steady for just a moment here. Now, do you notice how I've got a green and a single arrow here? It's because I need to pull my nose up a little bit more. You can see it start to flash at me. You can also see the angle of attack is actually not enough at the moment. So I'm actually going to decrease my throttle just a teeny tiny bit, but I'm going to leave it at about 130. And again, we've canceled out the approach because we started dripping too far below the glide slope. Looking out the window directly ahead of me, I can see very clearly where the end of the runway is. And you can see that our nose is up crazy steep, which tells us that we're coming in 
much too slow. So I'm going to go ahead and increase thrust just a little bit and get that nose to come back down. So even though we have this tool, even though we have the autopilot, you still need to maintain a solid situational awareness during any of these flights because some of this information just doesn't quite work out the way it needs to. Actually, I'm actually going to give myself even more thrust. Now, like remember what I was saying earlier when I was warning you that the thrust would be extremely high? I'm that far up into the thrust and we are still struggling in order to keep this aircraft properly level. If this were a normal plane, we could potentially be doing a lot of damage. I'm actually gonna disable the automatic pilot because it's not doing a terribly good job here. And again, these are all things you're going to have to compete with unless you get modifications that adjust this behavior. Otherwise, you're going to be bouncing all over the place just like I am here. But again, I just wanted to show you the general way to do it. As a general rule, I like to approach at about 130 knots. Don't forget to get your gear down. Don't forget to put your flaps down. Don't forget to make sure everything else is ready to go. I'm going to stick my head out the window a little bit. And again, ideally, you'd be using the indexer, which right now says I'm not at a high enough angle of attack in order to safely land the plane. But unfortunately, like I said, even though we followed it, we ended up flying below the glide slope and we got dangerously slow, which could have really made us get a really nasty accident there. So again, a lesson learned for everybody. Got a bit of a crosswind here. I'm gonna use my flaps, or my, I should say my rudder, just a tiny bit to kind of reacquire where we need to be landing. Looks pretty good, looks pretty good. All right, pretty good. When you're about 50 feet off the ground, you're going to want to gently reduce the thrust all the way to zero. And we're just going to hold the nose up just a teeny tiny bit and wait for the big kadunk. I don't know what it is with... Ooh, that was a little faster than it should have been, but that's okay. And we're going to go ahead and hold the brakes. And that's all there is to it. Hopefully this was informative. Again, uh, we had a little bit of trouble with that glide slope, but I'm noticing that's sort of a general rule in general. At the very least, you got a pretty good idea of how the avionics work, how this thing you know, can get airborne, how to control the mode control panel. It's just a matter of making sure that whatever you do choose to do with it, always keep a wary eye out for all the different settings. Enjoy.